It's great success. I was not able to record it this morning for whatever reason. So, um, cool. So um, I thought I'd just go ahead and uh, share my screen, which should be my editor, um, just so that we can look at the code. Is this an okay font size and color contrast for folks? Yep, looks good to me. Okay. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to talk through uh, code owners um, a little bit about um, how how the code works and how the fe where the feature sort of sits right now in terms of like what it does and where it's doing it and answer any questions that people have, um, confusions, concerns, comments, ideas for the future, all that sort of stuff. Um, I scheduled half an hour. I'm totally happy to go longer. Uh, it's the end of my day, but I don't mind going longer. Uh, I think we did a little over an hour this morning. Um, so obviously there's a lot of like, there's a lot of questions um, and I'm pretty much the only person who knows anything about it right now. So the more I can unload and lower the bus or excuse me, raise the bus number. Um, <laughs> we never want to lower the bus number. Um, but the more that we can do that, like this, the, the easier it's going to be for all of us as a team and also um, as individuals if we have to support these sorts of things. So if I go off on my another wild trip up to Alaska and I'm gone for three weeks and the problems start rolling in, someone else can, can dive in hopefully. So um, so I guess I'll just kind of uh, jump in and I invited Mark here as well because Mark you're working on some end-to-end -end tests for us. Uh, in, uh, is that correct to say? Yeah that's right. Wait a yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to make sure that you also had an opportunity to, to ask any sort of questions, kind of understand like how we're perceiving it today, tomorrow, and how the code works and whatnot. So um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you could make it. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Yeah, it'd be really helpful. Oh, totally. I mean, especially the more, more we, we're working hand in hand with you, um, I think the better we're going to be. Um, so the code owners, uh, as originally conceived, was meant to be um, a way to suggest reviewers for a given path, right? So it was never really meant to be sort of like access control, but as we rolled it out and we, we brought in um, uh, approval rules, more and more, more and more users were depending upon it as this really highly flexible access control for controlling, uh, doing change management and how changes were coming to their, their, their code base. Um, that's led to some interesting problems um, as we tried to apply things. So um, one, of the one of the things I did last summer was uh, we, we, we moved um, code owners to be enabled on individual protected branches. Uh, so actually in the, uh, in the repository configuration, um, there's a section you can go in, you can, you can individually enable like whether or not code owners are applied to a specific protected branch. So you'll see sometimes in the code where we're, at, we're saying like, hey, is this, is this branch, is this, should we be checking code owners on this particular branch or not? And that's, that's where that goes, feeds back into that feature from the UI. Um, it was, we launched that originally only for um, command line actions, um, which are almost entirely uh, push events, right? Like get push to a certain branch up, up on the service. Um, and one of the validations that, that is run at that time is this diff check class. Um, and it looks like I'm looking at not the EE version here. Let me grab the EE one. Here we go. Um, so the way, the way that a lot of these work is um, each of these sort of different diff check or excuse me, all the different check files all will uh, put a Lambda onto a stack that get that then gets uh, run at the end. The one that this one will run if um, we decide that we actually do want to run validation, uh, code owner validations against this particular event um, is this validate code owners, um, which, where am I? Ah, here. Um, it's right here. It just creates this new uh, validator object, which is a, a recent thing that I added in this last week, uh, and then runs it. There's only really three things that we need to know um, in order to run code owner checks. Uh, we need to know the project and the target branch, and then the paths that we want to check against the code owner's file. Um, code owners are always run. Uh, we always use the version of the code owner's file that is found on the target branch, the, the, the branch that we're attempting to make changes into. Otherwise, somebody could could include change, uh, a changed code owner's file in their, their commit 
and then that would be I mean, that's ridiculous because then they could they could set that to be whatever they wanted to. Um, so all of this is fairly um, it's fairly self-contained. Uh, the the tour. Oh, there we go. Um, in many ways, and um, all that it really does, helper methods and, and loaders aside, um, is it fires up a it creates it and, and, and activates a loader object. And the, what the loader object does is it it pulls in the file um, every time that we we need to parse code rules. We're actually opening the file and reading it uh, into memory. We don't save it uh, into Redis or into a database anywhere. Um, we load it and we parse out all of the entries, which are the, you know, the path and then a series of usernames or group names or user email addresses even, um, and convert those into um, entry objects, which have uh, three, three, three main attributes. One being the path that is matched. The other one being uh, the owner lines, which is a list of all the owners. And then finally, the section of the code owners file that it's found in. That's kind of a new thing um, that's gonna come out in three one, if, or three two, if everything goes well with uh, development, um, the, the sectional piece. Um, but that's, that's all that really happens. So in the validator, all we have to do is we have to say, do we have any entries? What entries is, is entries are any, uh, did any entries, or excuse me, lines or def of definition in that code owners file match against paths that we, we sent in here to, um, as part of that, things that were part of that change set. Um, I'm talking a mile a minute because um, I had a little bit of coffee. I just want to make sure I'm really curious about what people's questions are right now or if I'm, if I'm moving too fast or too slow for you. I'm good. I'm good too. Okay. Yep, I'm good. Just want to make sure. I'm kind of, I'm kind of like going over some basic ground as well because I don't know who, who might be viewing this video into the future. So I just kind of want to do a brain dump of, of stuff some of you probably already know. Um, There's a number of files. All of these files live in um, lib GitLab code owners has all of the files that are related to, to code owners processing, which is really, really handy um, because, you know, anytime you have everything like nice and, and tightly controlled like that is really great. Also, the code is very functional and stateless in this way that it always loads up the, the, the code owner's file and reparses it every time you ask, you try to, to validate a set of paths. Um, and it doesn't make any sort of statements or shouldn't make any sorts of statements about whether it's a valid action or not. Um, it, it, or rather, it won't try to extend its knowledge outwards about what you were trying to do. It merely responds with a nil um, here in the validator if there are no entries, if there are no matches between the paths and the code owner's file, or it returns an error string. Um, part of the problem that we had in the last couple of weeks was I kind of, I made the mistake of extending that and putting some of that state into, into that knowledge and that it bled over and, and got messy. So pulling that out and creating that, this validator object uh, kind of removes that and lets us target it a little bit easier and keeps it, keeps it with how in line with how the feature was originally written here. Um, take a look at the loader real quick. Um, there's a lot of like little tiny convenience methods in here. It's very abstracted and simplified. So there's a lot of simple complexity that's going on in here. Um, the user loader and the groups loader are probably the most interesting parts. Um, I'll, this is the, the main entries method. Um, just step through it fairly quickly. Um, loading bare paths, all that's doing is, again, is it's pulling out that those entries of like the path and then the, the user groups and emails um, of the identities of the people who are the owners themselves and creates these entry objects. Um, we then, user loaders and group loaders will, will loop over those and pull out the exact matches and the exact users and try to populate those entry objects to, to fill out who are the actual owners, not just um, a user's email address or the name of a group, 
but who, who is behind that? What GitLab account should we, should we reference as an owner in that situation? So the, users, the user loader, um, you can look up, um, users can be referred to in the code owner's file by their, user, their GitLab username or their email address. And there's a tool, uh, let's see, the reference extractor, which knows about how to parse email addresses out to, to get at a uh, possible username and does some lookup stuff as well here. Um, groups are a little more complicated because groups have members. Um, and this is where we got into some, some issues uh, in, the, in the incident from last month. Um, and I think, Mark, we've, we've had a little bit of back and forth on this as well, of like, what, what does it mean to be a valid group? Um, how the groups work is we look at, we had originally only created this list of groups that had been invited to the project. So if you specified um, at GitLab, you would have to have invited that group at GitLab to the project in order to, to match because what the group loader does is it creates this, this list of groups that are eligible to be expanded into ownership. Um, and there's some security reasons for why we do that because we don't want you to just be able to arbitrarily invite any group from your organization into, into a, excuse me, we don't want you to be able to specify any random group from your organization or, or you know, subgroups and whatnot um, without explicitly having invited them to the repository. Um, we wanted, I think, if I'm looking back and reading the history of how that came together, um, there was a desire to have that be a very deliberative act. That you are you are actually like going and making that choice to invite that group, um, and having to go through that process in order to give them that sort of ownership and control. So it's a two-step process on that. Um, we've recently added, um, and I think some of you have probably seen my code, my frantic trying to get this to work. Um, how do uh, we also pull in now the ancestors, so like the groups that own the project or that the project lives under, um, up to the root the root or the organization will also be considered possibles. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's basically it. Um, it takes this file, it, it pulls out the paths and a bunch of like potentially semi-random identifiers and makes some choices about who, who, who are the identities behind these people who are owners and associates them inside of these entry objects. And then we go through and we do matches. We say like, okay, for each path that I've been given, does it match one of these entry objects? Um, if no, great, no violations. If yes, we have a violation, return this, this error message string. So it's one of those, it's one of those wonderful nil else object sort of Ruby responses. Um, that's kind of the spiel um, about kind of how it works and a little bit about some of the stuff that's behind what we've been thinking about or historically the thinking has been around it. Um, what questions do you have right now? Um, I'm wondering if you could go over the case that I had trouble understanding where the code owner's rule specified a subgroup uh, and the user doing the approval was a member of the root group, not, uh, not a direct member of the subgroup, and so they're excluded. Um, is that something that can be explained in, in the code that we're currently looking at, or would that be simply a matter of the group membership, the group loader? I'm sorry, you're on mute. mute. Okay. I'm always muted. Most people are thankful when I'm muted. Um, I think that's going to that's really comes down into the the um, the group loader is where that that's going to happen. But it's also where um, it, it comes down to group membership. Um, the user has the, we membership in a group isn't transitive. There's no inheritance between a group 
a subgroup and a sub subgroup um, in terms of who we expect to be members of either. So um, if we have three groups, we have, we have a root group of A, a subgroup of B, and then a sub subgroup of C, um, you can be a member of any one of those three without being a member of anything higher in that chain necessarily. Um, so if we specify that group B, for example, owns this particular code, member, users who are not members of that group, explicitly members of that group, will not be matched as potential code owner approvers. Um, each, the way that we organize it I mean, there, there is that relationship, but, but each, each subgroup is in theory, like smaller. Um, and we wanna make sure that, that each group that is, is specified as a code owner is a targeted group. Um, so, let me see here. So really, um, I'm not seeing it right here in the code right now, um, but what we basically, whatever the group responds to when you ask inquire of that group object, dot users, who are your users? Who are you related to in the database? Those are the users that we consider. We don't, we don't then like walk that tree up or down to try to pick out other users um, and fan out across the hierarchy. Does that, does that fit with, with the explanation as we've talked that out before, or is that more? Yeah, no, no, that fits. Yeah. Um, it, would it be on uh, line uh, 46? Uh, I'm seeing in my code it might be out of date, um, but it's in the applicable ancestors method um, with users at the end. So group self and ancestors with users, would that get the direct members of applicable groups? Yeah, what, what that's doing is it's doing um, uh, preloading. So it's, it's, it, it knows that we're, we're going to want to want to access those users. Um, so it's just, it's, it's a preloading from the database. It's fetching it to reduce database load. Cool, all righty. Harry, I have just one more question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not that familiar with um, you know how the group meant to work in GitLab, but if they are not like um, inheritance, and what are we using them for, like organizing in a groups, like in subgroups and stuff like that? So, what's the benefit of having that if we are not you know inheriting anything from it? Um, that's a good question that I don't really know the answer to. Um, I mean, I can, I can tell you what my perception is, but I haven't worked with groups or studied them um, in how they fit or how the feature works. Um, but if you think about it in terms of each, each subgroup should be a subdivision or a more specific subset of the root group. So the root group is gitlab.org or gitlab-org, right? And so each subgroup is a more specialized group. So gitlab-org slash finance slash engineers. Um, and then we might have uh, slash engineers slash source code, right? And that would be us. Um, so it's each one is a little bit more specialized. So hierarchically they, they live under and they have, they have some relationships. Um, I'm not sure entirely what benefit that has in terms of the feature. Um, but for us, that, that membership isn't necessarily transitive down, down that subtree. It, it might certainly be up the tree, but it doesn't have to be from what I've seen. Like you could be a member of, if you have, again, if you have that like A, a to B to C relationship between groups, you can, I believe you can be a member of C without being a, group of, a member of group B, even though C is a subset or a subgroup of B. It's, it's a little wacky. Oh, yeah, I guess. I might, be wrong. I, I, might be, I might be entirely wrong. I haven't looked at it entirely deeply. Again, because the, the um, uh, code owners is really kind of where I've been interacting with groups in, in depth for the first time. And I really am only caring about like 
I've only really cared about like who are the members of these groups and then understanding that the way that the way that our users are interacting with with groups is to think about them in that sort of subdivision level um, like a, like a military unit like getting smaller and smaller and smaller more specific um, so that's why we went we, we were working with that inherent industry but membership doesn't necessarily transition between them I guess like I understand that you know if you are a member of B that's more specific to a so I guess that part makes sense but if you are a member of like B, when you specify the code of the rule for A, then you don't get to be included in that list. That sounds a bit, you know, strange, but I guess mm -hmm. there must be a reason. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's really like it might be something that we we want to we want to address. And and again, I, I might be entirely wrong. And as I'm saying it, I'm like, this doesn't sound right, Carrie. You've got to be wrong because um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so. I, Take that. Take what I just said with a grain of salt around membership and whatnot. Um, I just want to draw your attention briefly to um, uh, this here. Uh, when we're looking at like members or, or an, ent an entry, uh, so this is the the entry model. Um, when we try to we try to get its users, we have this method called all users. You see here, it actually goes through the list of groups, and it just it just maps out that group's dot users. Um, so for for that for that lot, that list of entries, or excuse me, the list of owners that's associated with with the, the individual entry, um, it, it's taking all those groups and it's parsing out all those individual users. And then you can see on line twenty nine, it's just it's just merging them with the list of actual users, like the actual at carries or at DS Kim, um, that are specified. So it, it doesn't it doesn't do any sort of walking of that, that hierarchy at that point. So we're really relying on groups to tell us who their members are. Yep, sounds good. Thanks for the explanation. Sure, I it it's confused me and like every single person who's worked on this uh, in the last few weeks uh, as we've tried to work on these problems, we all get to a point where we're just like, wait a minute, hang on. <laughs> How, how does this work? What is the relationship here between these different these different concepts and objects? So it's it seems to be a little bit confusing. Um, but every time I talk about it with people, um, like this morning and again here today, with you all, um, we're, I'm finding out what the what the what the story is about how this all sorts of fits fits together. And eventually, what I'd really like to be able to do is to be able to come up with some documentation over the next three months that speaks to not just developers internally, but also to our end users to explain how this stuff works in a very approachable way. It doesn't, doesn't rely on them already understanding these, these concepts, right? So like, how does code owners work? How can you use it for access control in an effective way? How does it relate to path locking? Like when, what situations would you want to use one or the other? Um, and, and the more that we can understand that story and how that story of the feature merges with what our users want to do, the more that we can actually build the features that they need, right? As we get, we come to sort of an understanding and we can start to set the, the, the successful patterns for how do you, how do you use this sort of feature? That's my, that's my spiel. Gary, I have, I have a question. I'm not sure if yeah. you're going to uh, show it to us in this class. Well, like, what are other what are the other like entry points to code owners? I mean, you mentioned earlier that uh, we validate code owners by leaf check. So, what what are other entry points? Like, I know we use code owners for approval rules, but aside mm -hmm. from that, what are what are the other things? Um. It's a little bit in flux right now, but I'll tell you how it's going to work by the end of uh, 13.1. Um, the diff checks, um, am I looking at the right one? Nope. Come on, go away. Sorry, the, uh, there we go. The zoom bar always gets in the way here. I have to carefully mouse around, okay. Um, so diff checks. This one um, will get 
there, there's two different there's two different kinds of events that we want to be um, that that trigger uh, diff check. Um, or excuse, there's really only one one event, and that is when the Git server receives a uh, Git receive pack event. And that's whenever you're doing basically a push or a merge. I, I think there's some other there's some other Git events, but those are the main two, 99% of, of Git actions. Um, funnel through that this this particular set of checks. Um, that works fine for the command line when people are just doing a git push because you never do a git merge from the command line. That almost never happens. Um, I don't actually can you even do a git merge from the command line? I mean to a remote server? I don't think so. Yeah. I don't I don't know. Um, that's a good question for me to find out. That's not a, that's not a piece of Git I've ever tried to do. Um, I've done some weird things, but not that one. Um, so so that works that works great for this. Um, some of the problems we had recently were we tried to enable this for for web events, and you can actually see here in diff check on line twenty three, we do a check here for if updated from web because we don't want web events to be funneling through this code um, because web events are not just pushes to branches, but it's also merge events because the server is re receiving this pack of new data that, that it's going to try to write. We don't want that running through here because there's a lot of automated processes um, and there's no reason to, to stop an action that's happening when it's already been approved. We should be relying on the approval rules feature to be handling approvals, not code owners. Um, and unfortunately, what, what I had done was I enabled it so that code owners were also basically acting as a second validation, which was what was breaking. Um, so the other, the other main entry point um, is for web events for um, if you, the file editor, I have actually an open MR that's pretty close to being merged, probably be merged tomorrow. That'll be using uh, this new validator. Um, I have a small little module that we can include into uh, controllers that we can call and it will, you just pass it the project, the target branch and the set of paths that you, you're curious about. And it will return again, this nil or string, depending on whether or not that particular change set would violate a code ownership rule. What you do with that knowledge, whether you stop that option, stop that action or, you know, print this particular error, or print a different error or what, whatever you want to do with it in the code, um, we don't make any, we're not going to make any sort of uh, assumptions about that. So that, that's primarily that second way of getting in there. And those are, it's going to be on the file editor, the single file when you, you, you know, click edit um, or the web IDE where you're able, I, you all have seen it with sort of looks like a little text editor and you can go in and like actually edit files and compose a commit. Um, that's another place that we want to stop it. Uh, also, if you delete a file, we should be we should be checking because you know if, if a deletion violates the code owner's rule we should probably stop that as well but those are the main those are the main entry points to it at the moment um, we also do some processing of course when we're setting up uh, approval rules um, where we go and we actually delete all of the existing ones and recreate it um, when we uh, i think is it the sync merge request um, I was just looking at it earlier today. Yeah, it's something with sync. Yeah, There's I have to. I, <laughs> I just search for code. I just act for code owners. Uh, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that file. I'll remember it this time for sure. Um, it's just a little service class, and what it does is uh, when something changes about the about the merge request, um, I think every single time it goes in and it deletes all of the existing code owner rules or all the existing approval rules, and sets up new ones. And as part of that, it also comes back in, reads the, reads the now existing version of the code owner's file as it exists on the target branch, recreates brand new approval rules of the code owner's type uh, and saves, the, or saves those into the database. Does that, is it, does that answer your question, Patrick? Yep, yep, okay. thank you. Of course. Kerry, do you know if uh, we've covered the known cases where the um, code owner's file wasn't updated or at least wasn't read again in the context of an MR? And so you could, for example, change a rule in the target branch um, 
in an MR that's already open and it wouldn't apply that rule when you tried to merge and so you could merge an MR that um, isn't consistent with an updated rule. That is a really good question. I don't know if changes to the code owner's file tr re-triggers that, that syncing or recreation of approval rules. That is a really good question. I, yeah, I knew there was an issue for that, but I haven't looked at it in a while, so I'm not sure what yeah. the status of it is. I, I think that, that it did. I met, Michelle was working on that, and I remember I was in the middle of something else, and I just saw a flurry of, of comments and, and commits going back and forth around that were used language that talked about that. So that might be the way that it works now. Um, I would, yeah, I, I, would I want to write a test. It. Yeah, I need to write a test for that one. I think that was an important one to have. I, I do know that that when we, if you go into the um, the repository settings and you disable and then re-enable code owner, code owner rules on that protected branch, it will recreate them at that time. So, I mean, you could, I mean, I, I know that there's, we manually do it there, but I, I honestly I don't know what happens. I don't know if we were tracking if we spot a change that's coming in to the code owners, if we then go and recreate all the rules for all of the open MRs or not. Um, if we don't, we should. Yeah, I think there was some discussion about, excuse me, there was some discussion about that being too much of a performance hit. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how that was resolved. I'm not sure if it is resolved. Yeah, and updating a lot of those merge requests. Uh, at once. Yeah, Seems I mean, like it, could be it potentially really could be. Um, yeah. I mean, my engineer brain is already spinning out how to make it faster. But um, yeah, no, I mean, on some projects, I mean, if you, depending on how many MRs you have open, it could take a, a lot of a lot of uh, resources to recreate all those. Yeah. Well, when I have time to write another end-to-end -end test, I'll okay. see where it's at. You know, it, it might be that we could um, uh, just an idea, and, and we can write it down or not. It's, I don't know. Um, we might we might want to be able we might want to capture the SHA of the the applicable version of the code owners when we create the rule, and then just do a quick comparison before merge to sort of say, hey, the approval rules those, or or like are, is everything up to date? Has this changed since we we had an approval? The same way that when you change an MR, it will, you can set it so that it will, um, it will clear all approvals, and you'll have to get new approvals if the MR has changed. Yeah, it sounds like that would be more efficient than processing the entire code file again, right. checking all the rules. It's especially because like the change might not, the change might not affect your MR, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I if I change a typo in my name but it was for a rule for a completely different part of the code base. There's no reason to go regenerate those rules for everything. It should only apply to the ones that, you know, are open. Um, so just do it, I don't know, like we, we could throw up a little, a little button or something that says, hey, you know, we, we have to, or, or I don't know, we, we could figure out what we do, but, you know, just capturing, if we capture it at the time of, of rule creation, what that, what the state, the, the identifier is. Yeah, that's the only way I can think about doing it. Yeah. Well, so yeah, it makes sense to me. Cool. Um, any concerns or comments or fears about about this particular feature? I fear the edge cases. <laughs> There's a lot of them. <laughs> there is a lot of them. I mean, we, and, and that gets back to that history that I, I mentioned up front. And, and I, I don't mean to apologize for it. Um, I, I would never apologize for it, right? But it, but it was intended as code reviewer suggestion. Um, and so I think that's kind of in the back of our mind, it's kind of been that way as a very lightweight access control that people are actually relying on it and they're doing some really intricate things with it. Um, there's a lot of potential complexity in, in, in the parsing and in the specifications about like who, can, who, who gets applied to what. And um, yeah, so that, that evolutionary uh, complexity has, has, has bit us. And so 
there's going to be there's going to be some stuff, and we're going to we're still going to see stuff uh, moving into the future. I think it, it will never be perfect. But at the same time, wow, people actually use this feature, right? Like, how cool is it? How cool is it to work on something that when you break it, people actually care? Like that, that's kind of that's kind of a good feeling. I mean, not to not to get too Pollyannish or silver lining about it, but um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, um, we are just a little bit over time, um, but um, if you have any other questions um, or thoughts, concerns, ideas, um, feel free, I mean, to, to drop them in an issue or at me or at the group. And of course, um, there's an epic for improving code owners um, that has a whole bunch of different ideas in it. Um, I haven't looked at it in a little while. I really only look at it when somebody posts something new in it, um, but I'll try to find it and uh, drop it into um, the Slack channel next couple days. Cool. Thank you, Carrie. Of course. Hey, thank you all. All right. Thanks very much. Ciao. See ya.